Seated. <laughs> Just one more thing. <laughs> this is, we've got video, we've got audio, we've got everything. <laughs> well, let's, let's pray. Our Father, thank you for Jesus. And as we read uh, the scripture today, we pray that the Holy Spirit would help us to see the spotlight is always on Jesus. It's always on Jesus. And may we see Jesus actually is calling us to him, to come into who, to his light. But to come into his light, we've got to let, let go of some things. Please help us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we've been working through Luke. And as we work, work through Luke, we found people on the margins, um, people like sick people, lepers, Samaritans, sinners, Gentiles, women, they all experience the power of God. Because in the upside down nature of God's kingdom, that's how things are. And in today's story, we have a wealthy man who approaches Jesus. And we need to understand in the religious world of Jesus' day, wealth was taken as a sign of God's favour. But this story ends with a tragedy and even Jesus became sad. That's quite something. Now most of us probably think we're not like this wealthy man. Well, let's see. We need to pay careful attention to the story. It's likely this chap had been in the crowd and heard Jesus say, just before this story, Truly I say to you, whoever, do, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, like a child, shall not enter it. Now he's at the top of a, of a social ladder, so this has caused him to think, well how do I get to heaven? So as a ruler he asked Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now this term ruler, in Luke at least, is always used of religious rulers. And some of the religious rulers of the day, particularly the group called the Sadducees, were wealthy, land-owning aristocrats. People occupying a position of very high status in the society. Well, you know, some pastors, present company excluded of course, some, some pastors are really happy when a doctor or a business person or such comes to the church. So most itinerant rabbis of the day would have been really uh, thrilled to be approached by a member of the elite. But Jesus was one of a kind. Good teacher is a title of respect, which on the surface suggests this man wants to be a disciple of Jesus, because the word for disciple actually means learner. It seems like he wants to be an apprentice of Jesus. But you know, since I've got a couple of titles and been called many other things, but <laughs> you'd be surprised what people have said to me. But titles, using titles is usually a status game. So he said, good teacher to Jesus, and he expects Jesus to return the favour. But by the end of the story, he will dishonour Jesus because he will teach, he will, he will treat Jesus' teaching as rubbish. Every time we compromise on what God, we know God says in Scripture, we do the same. Every time we compromise on what we know God says in Scripture, we teach, we treat Jesus' teaching as rubbish. When the Lord points out that only God is good, he's raising the bar on what true spirituality really means. And he's actually preparing the man for the crushing truth of what is to come. Though this story will end poorly for the ruler, we must be fair to his spirituality. The question, what must I do to inherit eternal life doesn't mean what must I do to merit eternal life. In fact, earlier in Luke, in Luke where Jesus explains the two great commandments, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbour as yourself, he ends that teaching with saying, 
do this and you will live. Jesus now provides the ruler with a list of things to do, a list drawn from the second part of the Ten Commandments and all these rules have to do with how we treat other people because because the, the God bit is left to later. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal. <coughs> Have you ever stolen anything? I never forget stealing from my parents. But um, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Do not bear false witness. I mean, everybody is less than fully truthful. Honour your father and mother. No one keeps that one, surely. And he said, he said, all of these I have kept from my youth. So this guy is pretty, he's pretty, he's feeling pretty confident about where he's at with God. And Jesus is not interested in making him feel bad by deflating his positivity. So Jesus doesn't say, for example, as he says in another place, in the Sermon on the Mount, actually you've committed adultery because you've looked at women lustfully in your heart. He doesn't say that. Because these sorts of transgressions, which are everywhere, are quite secondary. The Lord is interested in speaking to the deepest parts of the human heart, which is what he's going to do. So Jesus continues, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Well, this word from the Lord pierced to the true love of this man's life. For scripture says, you have to listen to what the Bible says because you might think you know what it says. It says the love, it doesn't say money, the love of money is the root of every kind of evil. Now notice, Jesus, no, there's no easier route with Jesus. He doesn't say, you know, you can keep some cash in reserve. He doesn't say, just tithe to my ministry and follow me. No. Jesus had already taught, you cannot serve God and? You can't. And he'd already taught, sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourself with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, when, the, when, you're, when you're gone, you leave everything. You can't take anything with you. This man had been confident that he understood God's ways in Scripture, but he failed completely to understand that God had given him great wealth, which was for the whole family of God, and it was to be released according to the word of the Lord. This encounter with Jesus was his God-appointed opportunity to enter into eternal life. The earliest Christians understood these things. So in the book of Acts, this is what we read about the first church. No one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. There was not a needy person among them. Well, how much wealth in this country? But there are plenty of needy people. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owner of, owners of lands or houses sold them, and it was distributed, the same language as this story, it was distributed to each as any had need. So in this early church, eternal life was bursting out of the people into the world. Well, what's the wealth the Lord has given you to share? Maybe you have gifts of hospitality, of friendship, of knowledge, of artistry, of prayer, of wisdom, of teaching, of administration, and lots of others. We need more, and I do know some of these people, we need more Christian lawyers who work pro bono. We need more health professionals willing to close the Medicare gap. We need more tradesmen who will take care of the underprivileged and so on. 
Now, this is a very big challenge. <coughs> and later in the Bible, John, that's the Apostle John, who was the best friend of Jesus, brings this home. He says, Whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they can see cannot love God whom they have not seen. It's easy to say you love God because he's invisible. Where's the evidence in your life? So the story moves on. But when he heard these things, he became very sad because he was extremely rich. Now this man's heart was crushed. It was crushed by the truth that he loved the things of this world more than he loved the things of the kingdom of God present in Jesus. He said he wanted eternal life, but he was actually unwilling to count the cost of such a glorious inheritance. He couldn't give up an identity tied to status, recognition and respect. He couldn't give to others without an expectation of return. He is far from the kingdom of heaven. It's not hard to say that Jesus is your saviour, but it sometimes feels too hard to follow him as the Lord of your life. If you've never struggled to follow Jesus, you've probably never followed him at all. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Can a camel go through the eye of a needle? No, and that's the whole point. It's impossible for a camel to be threaded through a needle. So naturally speaking, it's not to be expected that rich people will take on the humble status of the poor, the sick, little children and others who really follow Jesus and enter into the kingdom of God. Now the crowd are going to have something to say. Those who heard this said, then who can be saved? And Jesus said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Um, we go shopping in different places and um, there's a friendly, very friendly young man at the checkout. He just wants to be advanced in his work. But there's a very friendly young man at the checkout and I was saying this and that to him and he was telling me about his schemes to get wealthy and to be able to enjoy his wealth before he got old. Now, what's got hold of this man's heart is the same thing which had hold of the hearts of the crowd. Everybody wants to be prosperous. And in wanting to be prosperous, they show their lives are ruled not by God, but by mammon. So they are astonished. Can anyone be saved? This is very realistic. Now, thankfully, what is naturally impossible, God can do. Even greedy people. Have we got any greedy people here? Any, have we got any covetous people here? Oh, I, I, too many stories about people talking about someone else's car or someone else's house or someone else's whatever. Yeah. Have we got any... I didn't hear that. Um, have we got any selfish people? Yeah. Yeah, only God can save you. You, can't save, you cannot be saved. Only Jesus can save you. Amen. Only Jesus can break these powers. And Peter said, Peter's always got to have something to say, and Peter said, See, we have left our homes and followed you. And Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one, no one, who has left house or, or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this age 
and in the age to come, eternal life. Praise the Lord. Now, because Peter and the other disciples had done just what Jesus said the ruler needed to do. They had left their occupations, they had left their homes, and they had left their securities. And that was a sign <coughs> that they were seeking the kingdom of God more than anything. They were saved people. In God's kingdom, Jesus says, there's a new family, a new set of values about life's priorities. A few weeks ago, um, someone rang me up and asked if we could provide a couple of meals for a, a mutual friend who's been recovering from a major operation. Well, by the time I got there, she said, oh, I don't know if I've got room here in my fridge. I have, I've just had to ring up such and such and tell them, stop getting people <laughs> to bring food. That's a new family. It's the family of God. All right, we're at the conclusion. It's natural to want to be prosperous. But we're talking about the supernatural. At the very beginning of this gospel, loose gospel, Mary said prophetically before Jesus was born, he has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. <clears throat> well, look at this story. Empty of what? Empty of eternal things. Empty of the treasures of heaven. The rich young man left empty of the things of God. Not so much because he was choked by wealth, but more because he didn't believe Jesus personally had the words of eternal life. He left empty because the reality of his riches were, was more real to him than the words of Jesus and the promise of eternal life. That's the real issue. What's more real, the things of this world or the words of Jesus? If Jesus is really the Lord of our lives, we won't hoard the things of this world because compared to the glories of knowing eternal life in Christ, we know they're all perishable junk. Well, ask yourself this question. What do you speak about most passionately? What do you think about most committedly? If it's something or someone other than Jesus, that's where your wealth is. That's where your treasure is. That's where your heart is. And that's why the power of God's kingdom will not be real in your life. Incredibly, I mean incredibly, this young man ended up in a worse state than before he met Jesus. Do not be like this rich fool. If you want certainty about salvation now and assurance that when you die you'll go to heaven, let go or whatever you're holding on to in your deepest heart and follow Jesus. Now God sometimes gives people prophetic words which only become recognised as prophetic in hindsight. Sometime before he was martyred, Jim Elliot said, he or she, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I'll say that again. He or she is no fool who gives, which is to give to God, right? What he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. You can't keep the things of this world, but the things of Christ you can never lose. So today, what is it you have to hand over to the Lordship of Christ that you might enter or more powerfully enter the kingdom of God. Let us pray.